thank you all for jumping on so quickly and welcome to our webinar. Um, I have the great pleasure today of introducing our MC, Nadra Airman. She is a CEC okay. board member and the residential community manager at the Tobes Group, where she oversees a wide range of business activities and has been a leader in promoting sustainable business practices. She assisted in several green certifications of residential properties and has spearheaded many sustainability initiatives throughout the entire Tobes portfolio. Her community involvement, besides being a fabulous CEC board member, includes being a member of the Institute of Real Estate Management Central Coast Chapter and the Green Business Alliance, which is a business networking arm of the Santa Barbara County Green Business Program. She's also a Katherine Harvey Fellows alum. And for years, she has been a rock star Earth Day volunteer at our booth and staying late on Sunday to help us clean up before we all leave. So it's my great pleasure to introduce Nadra. Thank you, Kathy, for that wonderful introduction. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you, everyone, for attending um, this webinar and welcome um, to the Eating, Drinking, and Breathing Plastic webinar as a part of our webinar series. So as many of you in this meeting today may already know, an integral part of CEC's organizational model is providing educational, informative, and engaging events for the community. Of course, with COVID, we've had to pivot and create a way to still offer that same level of engagement and out of that necessity and ingenuity, these webinars will cre were created. So the CEC staff will be updating the community periodically on upcoming seminars until we're able to meet again in person. And who knows, maybe after we're still able to meet again in person, we may have these, anything's possible. So just a few housekeeping items. Um, this webinar is being recorded and you will receive a link to the recording and other resources discussed in the event and a follow-up email. And this is an active session. Your engagement is welcome and encouraged. Um, I also want to give a shout out to our fabulous support staff today. We have Lisa Hill, Iris Kelly, Katie Hirschfeld, and Laura Sanchez. And you are welcome to private message them in the chat with any special questions or concerns that you may have. Um, so we're going to ask for your participation today in a few ways. Uh, first, we're gonna be running a couple of polls after the presentation, so we would like to see your participation there. And then we also invite you to add questions to the Q&A uh, during the presentation, and we'll answer them during the last part of the meeting. And if you see the bottom of your screen, you have the Q&A and the chat um, right next to each other. And that chat box is there for any comments um, that you may have and our resources that you want to share. So um, before we jump into the presentation, um, we, I was asked to just quickly share my involvement with CEC and the plastic reduction activism. So as mentioned, I am on the CEC board and have been a member of the board since 2018. And I, I feel like somewhat ironically, my passion about the environment is heavily entrenched in the concept of our humanity. Uh, I believe that how we interact um, with and how we treat um, each other and the environment is a direct reflection of how we interact with and treat ourselves as fellow human beings, um, our individual selves as a species in general and not even to mention animals. And of course, if you asked anyone if they wanted nourishing food to eat, clean water to drink, clean air to breathe, everyone would say yes, which was one of the reasons I think that the title of this webinar is so apropos. So I think um, making that emotional connection to what sustains our life is integral to getting everyone to show up, change habits, influence policy um, and for the environment, which is really for the best interest of life itself. So that is the perspective from which I approach my environmental activism. So uh, without further ado, let's go ahead and get the presentation started. And we're going to start with uh, Kathy Keek. So Kathy King is the CEC Director of Outreach and Education. She has been with CEC since 2008 
and has been our Santa Barbara Earth Day Festival director since 2015 and has been a rock star in that role, as we all know. Um, Kathy also leads the CEC's Ditch Plastic Program, whose work includes plastic policy advocacy and Rethink the Drink Program and community education. So Kathy, um, what are we learning about the ways that plastic pollution is making their way into the air that we breathe? Thank you, Nadra. We are learning a lot about that. But first, I'm going to take a moment. Um, Uh-oh, not, my slides aren't moving. What happened? OK, I'm going to stop screen sharing for a minute because we tried to um, circumnavigate the technical difficulties by doing that and nope still not happening what's going on iris you have to exit full screen mode on the slides i think we thought we would get around technical difficulties by having these slides up before we started didn't happen well, that's okay that's we, 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 we all right. know how uh, it happens with zoom <laughs> sometimes so Can everyone see this? i think yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think everyone is sympathetic. <laughs> All right, thanks for your patience. The worst <laughs> happened and we got through it. Um, uh, we still got a screen share. I, I'm, you're not seeing this? No. Dang. I'm seeing it. What happened? I knew you should have done this for me, Iris. <laughs> there we go. There? Perfect. Hey, hey. There we All are. Right. Sorry again. <laughs> Uh, it's, always, it's always the scariest part, the technical stuff. So how did we get to this plastic planet? Plastic has only been around for about 100 years, and during that time, we become very dependent on it. There is a saying that says we're only about three feet away from something made of plastic every minute of every day. And if you look around, you will find that that is usually true. What is it made from? Mostly fossil fuels and their byproducts. It starts out as oil and is molded into like, tiny little pellets that can be turned into just about anything. It's very durable, so lots of products that we use over time are made from it, some that will be used for generations, like desk chairs in schools and my laundry basket. Modern medicine has benefited greatly from plastics, and we generally do not include that when we talk about single-use plastics. So what is single-use plastic? It's mostly personal convenience items like bags, food packaging, and bottled water that are meant to be used and tossed in a short amount of time. They have the potential to last for hundreds, if not thousands of years, and are only used for an average of 12 minutes. Almost half of all the plastic that's made now is single-use plastic. We have adapted to this culture of convenience so quickly and are using single-use plastic at such a rapid pace that we're having negative impacts on animals, the ocean, our land environment, and ourselves. The lightweight nature of this packaging means that it escapes out of collection systems easily. It's estimated that three out of 10 pieces get out that way, making their way into storm drains and creeks before ending up in the ocean. Plastic has become its own crisis, and a recent study really brings that home. There's a lot going on in the news these days, so this item may not have broken through to your sources. A new study shows that microplastics are now in the air that we breathe. During the pandemic, we've been taking some small solace that nature was getting a break from us and seemed to be flourishing while we stayed away. We marveled at photos of wildlife reclaiming Yosemite and other national parks. Unfortunately, a recent study published in the journal Science has shattered the illusion of a planet healing itself with a discovery that scientists are calling shocking. And that's a word that they don't use casually. After collecting rainwater and air samples for 14 months, Scientists calculated that over 1,000 metric tons of microplastic particles, the equivalent of 120 million plastic water bottles, are falling onto our Western US national parks each year. These invisible particles are coming off of items like, bottled, like plastic bottles and microfibers in our clothing. And once airborne, they are blowing out as dust and attaching to raindrops to form a new kind of acid rain. These particles are getting into remote global food chains, not just national parks, but in places like the Arctic. This study found that our oceans are burping up plastic particles that become airborne, contrary to previous belief that once they got in the ocean, they stayed put. These national parks only represent 6% of our country's total land area, and scientists have yet to study how heavily populated areas are being affected by these particles, but the outcomes are not likely to be beneficial to the health of any living thing. 
So that was a lot to take in. So let's pause a moment and ask you to weigh in on our next topic. A poll is about to pop up, Iris, whenever you're ready. And please give us your best guess on this question. How many pieces of microplastic are we eating, swallowing, or breathing each week? And we'll give you a few seconds to click in. Looks like a lot of people are responding. Thank you, we're already up to 50. You guys are fast on the draw. Almost everybody is clicking in. A lot of great responses here. Thank you. Looks like their responses are just about done. Did you close the poll, Iris? Yes? I ended the poll. Uh, thank you. So 35% um, chose 2,000, and that is the correct answer. No one chose three, <laughs> which is good, <laughs> because that would be that would be great, but it's not, not the case. So yeah, the correct response is 2,000. You can take that pull down. Um, so no matter where you live, you are consuming plastic. The 2019 study found that the average person ingests five grams of plastic per week, about the weight of the average credit card. These microplastics primarily come from, but are not limited to, seafood, beer, tap and bottled water, and salt. While we do not yet know the impacts of this extensive plastic exposure, studies are underway to assess the health risks. Scientists are working hard to discover our threshold rate of tolerance for plastic injection, the dose at, ingestion, sorry, the dose at which it becomes a health hazard. This is not yet known. As with other pollutants, the negative effects will be more pronounced in those with underlying health conditions. <clears throat> a stat that I'd like to share from this study that stuck out for me is that those who get most of their, most of their water from the tap ingest about 4,000 of these particles a year, while those who rely on bottled water get about 90,000 particles a year. This could mean that there is plastic leaching out of the bottles into the water. At this point, the science suggests that much of the plastic we ingest passes right through us. The question becomes, how much are we being affected by the other toxins and chemicals that are part of the plastic recipe? An LA Times editorial earlier this week pointed out that plastics contain bisphenol A and phthalates, endocrine disruptors that have been linked to reduced fertility and other hormonal problems, especially in growing bodies. Finally, as concerned as we are about the impacts of plastic to wildlife, these emerging human studies are showing that the plastic crisis is impacting our health too. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Kathy. That was um, very educational, and the, um, it's just there's so much to to take in with that. And um, we think about the end products of the plastics, but then a lot of times we um, don't even talk about the production itself and how many chemicals um, and, and the, the effects of the, the production of the, the plastic. So thank you very much for that. So now what I'd like to do is introduce Penny Owens. Penny is the Education and Community Outreach Director at the Santa Barbara Channel Keeper, where she's been since 2004. Penny leads the Channel Keepers Education Program, spending time with students both in creeks and classrooms, and she also manages their MPA Watch Program and their Single Use Plastic Reduction Initiative. So Penny, um, take it away. And what I'd like to know is how has um, the pandemic affected our use of plastic? You, I think you're still on mute, mute Penny. Sorry about that. Thanks so no much, problem. Nadra. <laughs> no Just, problem. I was proud that I got the screen sharing to work, but forgot to unmute myself. So pretty much since we've seen uh, the beginning of this COVID-19 pandemic, fossil fuel and plastic industry groups, also known as big plastic, have said that reusable grocery bags and food containers can spread the virus. To stay healthy, they've encouraged us to double down on supposedly safer single-use plastic items, things like disposable cups, utensils, and those plastic shopping bags. We've also seen an increase in takeout and delivery orders from restaurants as that was our only option available. 
Um, some businesses choose to use compostable paper to-go containers, but many of the to-go items we see are in plastic and some are even in um, styrofoam. So here locally, both um, Channel Keeper and CEC advocated for styrofoam bans in the city of Santa Barbara and also Carpinteria have enacted those, but um, unincorporated County of Santa Barbara and the city of Goleta businesses are still able to use styrofoam, which also can leak toxins into food sources especially if the food or the liquid is hot. Um, another change that we've observed has been a significant increase. Um, sorry, I forgot to progress my slides. Um, a significant increase in disposable gloves and masks. This is something we've seen locally, but it's also a trend that we've seen worldwide as well. And if you check out that trash can there on the side, that was a photo taken down by Ledbetter Beach by Shoreline Cafe. We've just seen a general increase in, in litter and debris. And um, as a lot of people are um, you know, visiting places, taking time to have that connection with nature, that outdoor time, which is very important right now, we've just seen an increase in litter at places like our beaches, our waterfront, parks, river swimming spots, and trailheads. And unfortunately, as we all know, these, all these single use items, they either get thrown away or maybe they get placed next to a trash can um, th those items can make their way into the ocean and then um, all the other plastic that successfully is thrown away will make it, its way to the landfill. Oops, sorry. The plastic industry pre-pandemic had projected roughly a 40% increase in production over the next 10 years. This is mainly fueled by cheap oil and gas released by fracking. The majority of these new production plants, including ethane cracking facilities and existing refineries and incinerators are located in the southeastern portion of our country and along the Gulf Coast. As you might expect, these um, facilities pollute our waterways, air, soil, and plants and food sources. And a recent statistic I just saw was that the EPA has found that people of color are 79% more likely than white people to live in communities where industrial pollution poses a danger to health. In fact, one area in Louisiana where those multiple um, production facilities, St. James Parish, has become known as Cancer Alley. And in our resources we'll provide after this webinar, we have a link to a great series that The Guardian did taking a deeper look at the rates of cancer in these, um, in these areas. Big Plastic has also worked extremely hard to spread misinformation around the safety of reusables during this pandemic. And now I'd love for Iris to please launch our poll. So as part of this um, misinformation spreading, the um, many areas have suspended their single use plastic bag bans um, temporarily. So in California, our governor suspended the um, plastic bag ban earlier this spring, it was a 60 day suspension. Um, it did, he did not extend it um, through the end of June, but during those few months, how many additional bags were used during the bag ban suspension in California? 2 million, 5 million, 1 million, 10 million. I actually, I don't see how many people have voted, so I'll let you run that, Iris. Excellent. So folks, we're leaning towards the 10 million number. We actually saw some sources that said it was almost up to a billion single-use plastic bags were used during that two-month period. So quite a few single-use bags. Am I able to close that? So as I mentioned, they were um, the plastic industry was successful in um, a basically a big coordinated PR campaign. They had pro-plastic op-eds, policy recommendations, articles, and they just really pushed this mis this like aura of uncertainty and misinformation about the safety and health of using reusables. Um, as I mentioned, that California's bag ban is back in place as of the end of June. And here locally, our city council passed an emergency order at the end of April that temporarily, temporarily suspended the 10 cent bag charge. That's still in effect. However, um, you shouldn't be seeing any of those really thin, flimsy uh, disposable plastic bags locally. And I just want to let folks know, as you can see one of our photos here, many of our stores are still concerned about the possible contamination with folks bringing in their own reusable bags. And we did some outreach to some fellow uh, grocery store employees 
And um, we've heard from the community that they've kind of been looked down upon for bringing their reusable bags. And so our recommendation right now is to go ahead, bring your reusable bags, leave them in your car, load your groceries into your shopping cart, take that shopping cart out to your car and load them into your reusable bag at your car. And don't forget to wash your bags regularly. Oh, sorry, my mouse is a little jumpy. And just continuing on with the reusables that are safe, um, this past June 20th, more than 125 virologists, epidemiologists, and health experts from 18 different countries said that it's clear reusables are safe to use during this pandemic. You just have to wash them. A lot of fear that was used um, and spread around the reusable bag by Big Plastic was um, actually referencing a, quite an old study that was done in 2009 that was industry funded and really failed to draw clear conclusions. In fact, one uh, counter report to that industry funded study said that a bag of pre-washed salad greens had the same amount of bacteria on it as that reusable bag did in the study. And that study also failed to mention that you know, washing with soap and water would, um, would result in a clean bag. As we learn more about the coronavirus, we know that transition, transmission occurs much more commonly through person-to-person -person contact through respiratory droplets rather than through objects and surfaces. And on that note of reusable cutlery, in the US, we use an estimated 40 billion plastic utensils every year. And that was pre-pandemic. So we just wanna make a plug for folks to remember if you're ordering takeout and you plan to eat at home, make sure to let them know you don't need those plastic utensils. And to ca consider carrying your own reusable and washable utensils with you. Um, this, the industry was actually successful in getting the CDC to include that um, single use and disposable plastic cutlery were a better option for restaurants reopening. However, we're fortunate here in California, Cal OSHA, had went ahead and said that reusables were safe. They just needed to be handled properly and washed properly. But we encourage you to bring your own cutlery with you and to ask before they're, they're bringing out um, any of that single, single use disposable cutlery because once anything's been on your table, it has to be thrown away. And with that, I'll hand it back to you, Nadra, thanks. Thank you, Penny. Um, that is a lot of great information and I know um, there's so, it feels like there's so many unknowns and there's so um, much information that, uh, dissenting information that we receive. So it's really good to be able to have, um, you know, that information about what we can actually do. And um, even when we have conflicting um, opinions from CEDC, which is supposed to be the place that most people are supposed to go. So, um, you know, I, I, it's knowledge is power, basically. So being able to have uh, spaces like this where we can reaffirm like, yes, this is something that you can do and this is how you properly do it is really important. So I'm seeing that we're having, uh, we have some uh, uh, questions in the chat. And so um, Iris, I, are you, I think we're going to be moving those over um, to the Q&A, and then we're going to be answering those towards the end of um, the presentation. Of, so just wanted to remind you guys that, so please keep those questions coming. Um, we, we will definitely get to them in just a bit. So um, we're going to keep uh, the presentations rolling, and now I would like to introduce uh, Tony Marietti. Uh, Tony Marietti is a second year environmental studies student at UCSB and she has been involved with the campus chapter of CalPERC since last year and is the incoming coordinator for their Plastic Free Seas campaign. Um, so Tony, how have you been involved with climate activism since you arrived at UCSB? And you're still on mute just as FYI. Oh, perfect. <laughs> yeah, let me just share the screen. Is this working? I, I can't I can't see your screen yet. Hmm. Let me see. There we go. Perfect. We're going? Mm-hmm. 
Okay, amazing. Uh, hi, my name is Tony Marietti, and I am so grateful to be here talking about an issue that I am so very passionate about and intend to work on my whole life. Um, after taking my first environmental science class as a senior in high school, I had yet to commit to or even apply to any universities, uh, but I knew with certainty that I was going to be working towards a degree in environmental studies. Um, so in the fall of 2019, I started my courses at UCSB and I was exposed to powerful presentations and points of view that matched my own surrounding our environment. Um, right away, I felt as if I were immersed in a world of environmentalism where people who shared the same passions addressed the issues I cared about with the urgency I always knew they deserved. I truly love learning about the issues we face today like climate change and plastic pollution and their effects on our past, present and future. But the most amazing thing I discovered as a student here was that I didn't have to wait to get my degree um, in order to make the change that I wanted to see in the world. Uh, for me, UCSB really didn't feel like home until I found CalPERG. Um, I joined this public interest research group because of its three main principles to promote civic engagement, make college affordable, and protect the environment. I wanted to barrel past the feelings of anxiety and guilt that come with apathy and actively work towards something that I felt was going to make a difference. Um, I've been with CalPERG since the start of winter quarter last year, and I can say with certainty that I have steamrolled past passivity um, and achieved things that I never knew I could do as a first year in college. Um, upon first joining, I was an intern on CalPERG's end oil and drilling, um, oil and gas drilling campaign, where I learned grassroots skills and activism, and I petitioned, educated, and helped put on, on events to publicize the issue of hydraulic fracturing. Um, we held a documentary screening of Gaslands, which is an amazingly impactful documentary highlighting the detrimental effects that oil and gas drilling um, have on both the environment and people alike. This was followed by an esteemed faculty panel, uh, which provided insight on both environmental and social issues surrounding this form of drilling, which unjustly um, affects communities of color and shoots a copious amount of toxic cancer-causing chemicals into the earth that leach into water supplies and pollute the air. This campaign ended the quarter with a very high visibility event that um, we called the human oil spill. Not only was Santa Barbara rallying for this issue, which proves local to us, but we came together with the other chapters of CalPERG across California at the other UC campuses for a UC-wide human oil spill. Um, here is a picture of part of our demonstration on this slide. So for the first part, we laid on the ground dressed in all black while student poets read their work with passion towards this issue. Uh, we then stood up and rallied behind student leaders as they preached the importance of change and taking charge. Uh, we had media coverage and used this to demonstrate to Governor Gavin Newsom that we demand a difference on this form of destruction while educating students on how unjust amounts of energy and resources are put towards this process which pollutes the planet and leads to the production of oil which is largely used for the production of plastics. Um, spring quarter was off to a rocky start with the pandemic, which provided much anxiety and uncertainty. But even so, that did not warrant the stop of student activism, um, and CalPERG continued on its mission with optimism and persistence. We held virtual recruitment drives and found that the want for change amongst our generation is not easily diminished. Um, it, I began working on our Plastic Free Seas campaign as a tactical coordinator, building coalitions on campus with like-minded groups in support of two monumental bills in the legislature, um, AB 1080 and SB 54. These two bills would reduce plastics made or sold in California by 75% and make the rest recyclable or compostable by 2030. Um, these would be some of the most progressive bills passed, and we met with Assemblymember Monique Lamone, um, who stated that she thought they do have the support in the Senate and Assembly in order to pass, but advised us to wait two sessions to try and pass them. Um, with the pandemic and budget cuts in California's government, she felt that if they were to pass now, the enforcement um, would be weak and would be more beneficial in the long run to work on these bills when they could be properly enforced. So CalPERG will most definitely continue this work because of how influential AB 1080 and SB 54 will be on this war against plastics in the long run. Uh, but in the meantime, we're going to be taking on many other projects. Um, so I'm super excited to have been made the coordinator of the Plastic Free Seas campaign for next fall, where I'll be continuing to work on reducing plastic pollution by seeking to strengthen the UC commitment to phasing out single use plastics um, and striving to transition IV to being plastic free. Um, even further, this summer I'm working with CalPERG's new voters project, which has already succeeded in registering thousands of students to vote um, in order to uh, continue this work so that young people's voices are heard in the election this fall, because it is so crucial to make structural change and elect people who are going to pass the regulations and laws needed for more wide-scale change among climate-related issues. 
So if you're seeking a way to make a difference, this one fundamental act of voting that is so often overlooked is a way you can work towards officiating the change you want to see. Um, the issues of things like climate change or plastic pollution are not simple. There is no single straight path towards a solution. There are many routes offered um, for your drive headed towards the destination, whether it's casting your vote and working towards structural change, signing petitions, making educated choices when it comes to what products you buy, um, or joining a group where you can meet like-minded people who desire to work towards the same things. Um, the same hopes for the future that you have. It's crucial to not remain passive on what you deem as important. Um, these global problems appear very overwhelming sometimes, but ignorance is not bliss. It's super important to be uncomfortable and educate yourself about the state of our world. These problems should not be drowned in pessimism. Uh, we are not helpless in being subjected to the issues of climate change or plastic pollution, nor should we be weighed down by the burden. Um, there's always an action you can take, a habit you can change, or people you can meet that can rid you of that feeling of passivity um, and help you find your way on a road towards change for the better. Thank you so much. Tony for president, yay! <laughs> <laughs> That was great, Tony. Thank you so much. That was so inspiring. And um, we're just so in awe of your leadership and um, can't wait to see all the amazing things that you are will and continue to do. Um, and I really appreciate um, the actionable items. So important because the information that we get every day, there's always a report that, oh, the, it's worse than we had initially, uh, you know, suspected. And there's so much of that. So being able to stay optimistic, to be able to not get apathetic, to not um, feel overwhelmed is, is so important. So thank you so much for reminding us of us, reminding us of that. So, um, and that is a great segue into Plastic Free July. And these are definitely actionable items that we all individually can take to make a difference with this. So, um, Kathy, why don't you tell us a little bit more about Plastic Free July? Sorry, I had to unmute there. Thank you. No Penny's queuing up the slide so that I don't botch that again. Um, so, and and you're right. This is you know now we're we've we've talked a lot about heavy issues. Um, and thank you, Tony, for your incredible perspective and optimism. Uh, and and now we're we're pivoting toward what we can all do, right? And Plastic Free July is something that CEC and Channel Keeper have partnered on for the last few years because it, it is about that. It's about the small changes that add up that we can do. Um, Plastic Free July is in its 10th year this year. It was started by a woman named Rebecca Prince Ruiz in Perth, Australia in 2010. She, is, she was a, um, a city employee looking for a way to create something that would spark people's interest. Um, and now it has grown into a global movement with 250 million participants in 170 countries. And now they even have um, they've created a foundation called Plastic Free Foundation that is an organization doing outreach and education with the core beliefs that inclusivity, solutions focus, and behavior changes can add up and make a big difference. And some fun ideas that I picked out from their website to share, um, and I heard the, the, um, the founder was on a, a podcast the other day, and she's great. Um, she talked about doing a home pantry or waste audit. You can learn a lot from your own kitchen by just seeing what's there um, and what you can change. Um, if you're brave enough, you can look in your trash can. Otherwise, you know, just look in your refrigerator and your pantry and see what, um, what adjustments you can make. Um, you can also be proactive and reach out to companies whose goods you use to ask for them to um, provide more sustainable packaging. They really do listen. Um, plastic Free July was designed to, as an opportunity to recommit to our plastic reduction goals and then keep them going year round. You know, with Earth Day, we say we have the Earth Day Festival to celebrate and come together, but that every day is Earth Day. So we can also make every month Plastic Free July. Perfect, Kathy, thank you. And um, now we're gonna move on to Penny. So Penny, can you speak more about Plastic Free July um, with the Santa Barbara Channel Keepers as well? Yeah, just to I kind know. of build on what Kathy was saying, you know, some other options. This is really about finding what works for you. And um, it's kind of a journey and you want to do the best that you can. 
and try to find um, choices and opportunities where you can reduce your use of single use plastic. So another great tip we heard was to take the shopping cart challenge where each time you're at the grocery store, you can look at your items and select one or two items that you will remove from your cart and commit to trying to find uh, in a different way or maybe making your own hummus next time uh, with different options. Another uh, message that we really liked and we've been hearing a lot is updating the three R's from reduce, reuse, recycle to refuse, reduce, repurpose, reuse, and then lastly to recycle. And you know, like Tony was saying, take action, vote, use your voice, you know, support local, state, and even federal policies. Um, I don't know that it will get a lot of traction this year, considering all the other um, serious issues we're facing, but there was some proposed federal legislation called the Break Free from Pollution Act that um, would mimic a lot of what the California bills were looking at doing and could really go a long to way towards reducing our dependency on single-use plastic. And we just encourage folks to take advantage of this opportunity to examine your relationship with single-use pl plastic and commit to doing better. Um, we have this cute little octopus logo that um, one of my old coworkers, Laura Mead, uh, several years ago that was part of our initial education campaign to just skip the straw, just say no thanks and think about how we don't necessarily need some of those items of convenience that just are automatically provided. And she updated it for us to include a lot of these other items. And so we encourage you to visit CEC's website and take our pledge to, um, to reduce um, and choose to refuse single-use plastic. And then We'll also like to encourage folks to join us. We have another plastic webinar coming up on Wednesday, July 29th, same time, 11.30 to 12.30. And there we'll discuss updates on the um, Community Outlets Film Recycling Project that's gonna be reopening soon, of which Channel Keeper and CEC support as additional drop locations. And we'll also review the do's and don'ts of blue bin recycling with ex experts from the city of Santa Barbara and Marburg industry. So thank you. And I'll hand it back to you, Nadra, now for questions. Perfect. Thank you so much. So I'm looking through the chat and we have some questions. Um, that are on the chat and then we have, I'm sorry, on the Q&A, but then we have um, some information over here on the chat. So I'm just gonna go a little back between uh, um, both of them. And so I know there was a question and I may go back and forth about um, uh, plastic bags and where we can take them to recycle them. And so there was some information in the chat about those really weren't being recycled. Um, they were being sent to foreign um, other countries, developing countries, where then they were then being burned, um, but they weren't really being recycled. So Kathy and Penny, um, do you guys want to speak a little bit more on that? And before you do, actually, we're going to speak more about that on the film Plastics and Recycling on July 29th. But um, is there anything you want to add now here? Sure, we can touch on it today. We, we had a feeling that this was going to be a big topic, which is why we are doing the webinar part two. Um, this one, we really wanted to get out this new information, um, as Penny talked about with COVID, and um, just really wanting to emphasize that this is a human-to-human -human respiratory transmitted disease primarily. I was just listening to a podcast this morning on my run. I know I don't listen to music. I listen to this stuff um, that where there was an epidemiologist who said there has not been one case of surface to human transmission. I mean, that that doesn't mean there never will be, but it is very low likely. So the demonizing of these items, um, you know, is really something that we wanted to um, to relay to everyone today so that you might feel more comfortable about your reusables and not think that we need to rely on disposables. Plastic bags, um, someone asked about why we can't take them to the grocery stores anymore. That went away when we passed our law. Um, it was a requirement of a previous law that they had to take them back um, when there was no other really mode to recycle them because they don't do well in the, the um, conveyor belt systems in recycling centers because they get tangled up. Uh, one year San Jose spent a million dollars untangling their conveyor belts from this film plastic stuff. So that's why they stopped taking it in recycling centers. And also, it's just not that valuable. You know, recycling is a business and you need value to these items for them to be continued, you know, for to be continued. Um, and, and film plastic just isn't that. I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Penny. That was great. 
Yeah. Um, and um, one other thing is that a lot of times the when it's a plastic is recycled, it's degraded. So um, it becomes a, a lesser product, and and then so if you have a, a weak product to begin with, then you can't really downgrade it to anything else. Um, so and then we have another. Uh, question about the clean plastic vegetable and fruit containers, such as Costco and Trader Joe's. Um, do you guys want to speak quickly to that? Or is that pretty much July 29th? <laughs> Come back uh, to us for July 29th. <laughs> okay, there you go. But, but again, um, that plays on what Kathy was saying, where those right. items are really low quality plastic and there's just no market for recycling them. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, and that goes into, we do have um, in the chat, we have the link to the webinar for the film plastics. It was sent from CEC to all panelists at 12.01. So if you guys want to go ahead and sign and um, uh, sign on to that webinar, you're welcome to do that right now. Um, and then there's more information um, about plastics in our time of the pandemic on the Santa Barbara Channel Keepers blog. And I, and recently when I was um, preparing for this webinar, I um, watched, and I'm sure many people on this call may have watched it already, but the story of plastic, the documentary. And so that really gives a really good overview of what is happening, what is actually happening to our recycling. And so we want to do so much and we want to do a good job when we recycle, but the more we understand about what happens once we throw our recycling in that bin, the more we can make um, those educated uh, choices about how we choose to consume. Um, got a lot of, uh, Wonderful comments for Tony. Yes, we love Tony, and uh, she gives us so much hope for the future. So thank you again on, for that. Um, again, that was the vegetables. Uh, I mean, I'm going through these, so forgive me, but I just want to make sure that we get everyone's comments in. Um, okay, and so I think those were a lot of free repeat. So, um, and there's a lot of information um, that our uh, attendees and participants are giving a lot of good information about the city council and, and different initiatives. So um, definitely check that out. So, but I'm just going to go ahead and start on the, the question and answers. So we have um, a question from Nancy Black. Could you talk about what's happening with recycling and what's recycled today? And why it's best not to use plastic to begin with. And I think we we did kind of cover that, but Penny and Kathy, is there anything else that you want to add to that question? Sorry, I was answering a question in the chat. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, it it's said, very can, active, which is great. Uh, yes, it is. It's great. It's like, which one do I look at? Yeah, um, yeah. I, I, didn't, I was trying not to get distracted by that, but there's a lot of great, great conversation happening there. Um, definitely. So what was the question again? Um, no problem. Can you talk about what's happening with recycling and what's recycled today and why it's best not to use the plastic to begin with? Thanks. Well, Matt's I think that black. comes around to the motto that Penny and I always share whenever and we didn't today, but we usually do, which is the best single use plastic is the one that we don't use in the first place, um, right? Do you want to add to that? Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and and I think you know, as far as what's happening with recycling and what is what you're able to recycle today, we're absolutely going to cover that in a lot of depth in the next webinar coming up later this month. But you know, truly, like your question, why, and why it's best not to use it in the first place? That absolutely is the the best course of action is to reduce your use of those items as 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 much as you can. And it's not about going to zero. Right. It, it, with all of this, you know, our carbon footprints are never going to go to zero. It's just about reduction and balance, finding that balance of, you know, the things that we absolutely need that come in this material and the things that we can find workarounds for. Right. And sharing that information. It's like climate change. You know, the, the, the anyone who is an expert in climate change communication will tell you that talking about it is you know, first and foremost right now. We just have to have it be part of our everyday conversation. Um, and I'd like maybe Tony could weigh in on that with how she's dealing with that with fellow students because it, it can be a downer. And this can be a downer too, but also just, you know, talking about it, you can find, you can learn good tips from people 
um, with with how they are managing, you know, to use less plastic. You know, Nancy Black in the chat is saying that she's trying to go 100%, which is, <laughs> is a huge goal. Yeah. Um, maybe we need to get her to, to come speak about that. But, but it's, it's not about getting to zero, right? It's just about as as much reduction as you can have as you can handle and that all adds up right definitely um so we have another question from Kristen Hoag, the plastic industry lobbyists are pushing to eliminate plastic bag bans altogether claiming that reusable bags pose a public health risk what is the C what is cec doing to reverse this single use trend I can take this one, Kathy, if you want. <laughs> I, I kind of, I talked about this a little bit in my slides um, where they actually were quite successful in getting several state and municipalities to either temporarily suspend or to delay implementing single use plastic reduction policies. That said, several of those have actually moved forward now while a few have continued to um, delay during this kind of health crisis issue that we're dealing with. I think one of the main things we can do is to educate folks about what's happening and encourage them to speak up and engage with their community and let elected officials know they support these, these policies because that's what's happening is they have such slick lobbyists coming in and hitting, him, hitting these elected officials from so many different angles. You know, they're just hearing, they're hearing all this misinformation, they're kind of spinning information. So just talking about it, talk about it with your peers and your colleagues and your community encourage folks to get involved and to, and to dialogue and communicate with elected officials so that when they're able to give a little bit of bandwidth to these, these issues, they're informed and ready to make good decisions. Definitely. Yeah, just like you said, having it part of the conversation and being informed is really a powerful tool that it seems like, oh, that's great and all, but what can I do? But actually that is a good step. Like just being able to be informed and to share that information um, is, is an, really, really helpful. So we're gonna move on to the next question um, from Peggy Payton. How can we get the source of single use plastic instead of putting the onus entirely on consumers? How can we influence policy regarding big plastic? Great question, Peggy. It is a great question. And it, it's, I think with, with, as with so many of these issues, it is a top down, bottom up issue. You know, we need to, as consumers, do the best we can, but we also need to put pressure on manufacturers to assume some producer responsibility. You know, they, they are just allowed to externalize all of their costs in terms of disposal. And plastic has proven to be one of the worst on the disposal side of, of any of these products. You know, aluminum, like you were talking about the, how it degrades when it's recycled, aluminum, glass, paper, you can continually, those are actually recyclable items, but plastic, really has never fit into that model. Um, and yet they're allowed to continue making all this plastic willy nilly. Um, and I think it really does, they really do listen when someone takes the time to contact um, them companies because so few people do take that time. So it, it can make a difference. Yeah, definitely. And um, going back to the documentary, one of the things that they discuss is having brand audits where you look at the brands that are the heaviest um, plastic waste um, contributors and making demands of them and using the consumer dollar um, to really make that change. It's like, and what um, is really interesting right now is that we vote and at the poll, but we also vote with our dollars and, and how we can continue to build momentum to, in effect, boycott certain, you know, um, or put pressure and at least on these, uh, you know, these heavy offenders to make them change their, their ways and their business model. So, um, sorry, that's my, I'm not supposed to be, <laughs> I don't know if I overstep my bounds as a moderator, but there you go. So, <laughs> Patricia Card, um, the next question, what makes plastic have value, uh, quality or value? How is one kind more valuable than the other? Um, well, to my knowledge, numbers one and two are the most recyclable. They are more, they're more sturdy. They're not that, you know, flimsy, squishy type. Um, and, and also the larger items 
um, you know, when you when you have that conveyor belt human run system where they are literally picking off what they deem to be the most valuable items, the big stuff is going to get chosen first, you know, detergent, um, so large soda bottles, things like that have the most value and can be, you know, broken down back into other items more easily. Do you want to add anything to that, Penny? So if you're saving, if you're like carefully saving the little twist off thing that comes around on a pill bottle, you don't, it's okay. You can give yourself a break on that and just throw it in the trash. <laughs> it's really, it's too small um, for any, but for, for it to get picked in that situation. And it, it doesn't recycle anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we got a lot of work to do. No. <laughs> um, but if we all do it together, that's what that's what uh, is important. So the next question is, is Ablet's recy uh, accepting recycling plastic now? Um, so again, that's more toward the 29th, but um, it's a quick yes or no. Do you guys have any response to that? Sure. I saw that there were quite a few questions in the chat about that and, and some other questions that were even um, responding to our comments that a lot of that film plastic and some of the other types of plastics besides number one and two are not as valuable. Well, then why is Ablet's able to recycle this? And part of that's because it's a consumer source sorted uh, plastic. So it's, it's not having to go down that conveyor belt and jamming up machines. That film plastic is already source separated into only clean and dry film plastics. And the Ablets um, program is coming back online soon. We'll talk more about this later. And um, both CEC at our next webinar, but both CEC and Channel Keeper are available to take film plastic by appointment right now. And it's um, just for folks that are uh, been storing up five months worth of, uh, or several months worth of film plastic in their garage. I get a couple of emails a day. Um, we uh, just wanna let folks know that we're gonna try to implement a little bit slightly different pro procedures so that folks are gonna be sorting their own film plastic with either staff from Channel Keeper or CEC or Ablets until they get to a point where they feel like they are 100% um, certain we're only getting absolutely the correct types of film plastic and that it's all dry and clean. And then they'll be able to schedule drop-offs still by appointment only at specified times. So, um, uh, and yeah, that's all I have to say about it now. Kathy, do you wanna yeah. add to it or? No, I didn't want to add to that. That was great. And we will cover that um, in more detail in a few weeks. But um, I, I, saw, I saw a question in the chat about the statewide bills. Um, and, and Tony had touched on them in her talk. Um, and maybe I wanted to give her a chance to explain to us a little bit more about these, because um, they, they're potentially monumental um, if they pass. So Tony, um, do you want to share a little bit more, um, since people are asking what um, AB 54 and SB 1080 are about? Yeah, for sure. Um, so those two bills would uh, reduce plastic pollution straight from the source. So it would stop the production of majority of plastics made or sold in California and then make the rest of them recyclable or compostable by 2030. So they have the potential to be very powerful. Um, but right now we were advised that if they were to pass, um, there would not be much enforcement for them given the um, current state of California's budget. And a lot of, like you guys were saying, uh, the stigma around using uh, reusables at this time um, is why they say that it's not likely to be enforced properly if they were to pass um, now. One thing that I did hear about those um, is that the reusable um, sector will create more jobs than either the recycling or the disposable sectors. So those are kind of good things to push on when we're talking to people who might not um, be as concerned about the environmental impacts of these things, but that there is job creation associated. Um, certainly, I think no one, no one was going to think ill of job creation, especially right now. Yeah. Well, somebody, just, somebody, thank you, Michelle, from mm -hmm. um, Monique Limon's office just put a link to the um, bill in the chat. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Um, and so we have a question in the Q&A. Can you identify and talk more about the California proposals to reduce plastics, which I pretty think um, much we just covered that. So we'll, we'll go ahead and move on. 
Okay, so um, we're going to go to one more question. Um, and so I know we have a few more here, so I'm sorry if we didn't answer your questions in this one, but um, we can, if maybe we can send an email or something else later to make sure you get your question answered. Um, so we have, um, can you send the best email addresses for Trader Joe's and Costco to read? A quest using non-plastic packaging. I have tried to contact them with not much luck. We can look that up. Okay, perfect. Um, all right, um, that was a quick one. So I, ha I have one more because we had the one for the 29th, which was answered. Um, what happens to deposit money that is collected for cans and bottles? Um, they used to have places to return for cash. Now there are fewer places to take them. I don't really know. Yeah. I think that the I think that the stores get to keep some of it, and then some of it's supposed to go into a fund. Is that what happens? Yeah, some of it goes back into a statewide fund. I'd have to look up information on that um, as well. But yeah, I've been following. They've closed quite a few of the recycling centers. Um, that was a big issue, especially in the Bay Area, for a lot of their kind of homeless community that actually would pick recyclings out of trash cans and generate funding. And as they were closing some of those, it became a kind of interesting social justice issue as well. But here locally, I actually think I just heard this week that Marburg had those recycle centers available. If you did want to do the CRV cash redemption for your cans and bottles, and um, they had to close those this week due to um, a COVID-19 um, situation. So keep, I would check the websites to see if they're open locally. And um, I dig a little, I'd have to dig a little bit more for a better answer on, you know, where that funding is going. There's been a lot of talk about at the policy level in Sacramento about kind of revamping that program. And I think some of that would be part of some of those statewide recycling bills as well. Perfect. Um, and there was just one last one about where does the film plastic that, um, <laughs> as it's recycled, where does that go? It goes to a company called Trex that reuses the, um, the plastic for their um, products. We'll talk more about that on the 29th, but I just wanted to give the high level review answer for that one. <laughs> um, so it's 12.29 and um, we want to be respectful of everyone's time. So we're going to go ahead and wrap um, this webinar up. But before we go, I just want to thank everyone again for attending. Um, and then as you know, we've I mentioned, we have the July 29th uh, Film Plastics webinar, 11.30 to 12.30. So please register for that. We'd love to, um, to have you there. There as well um, that will be featuring Kathy King, Penny Owens, staff from Marburg, as well as staff um, from the city of Santa Barbara. And um, when you leave, um, you'll be directed to a survey about this webinar. If you could please fill that out, that just helps us to know how we can keep having engaging webinars for the community. And so we really want your feedback on that. And again, um, all the attendees will receive an email with a link of the recorded webinar and additional resources resources that were in the chat. So um, please share that with anyone in your network that you think would um, benefit. And again, thank you so much. And uh, hopefully we'll see you at the next webinar series. Thank you. Thank you.